a message about Moab, a prophecy and proclamation against Damascus, a prophecy and proclamation against Ethiopia. And Paul writes to the Colossians concerning being reconciled by Christ and responding to Christ in faith. Today on 3 and 1, as we consider Isaiah chapter 16 through 18 and Colossians chapter 1. The proclamations against the nations continue. This time, Moab, Syria, specifically Damascus, and Ethiopia. Gentile nations doomed to destruction for their rejection of goodness and godliness and God's invitation for salvation. Remember, this invitation was to go out to the nations as well. Israel was simply to be a banner, a, a billboard, a visible example of a real relationship with a real God, even under the Old Covenant. See, if Israel was good or bad or even ugly, the nations would still see that God was real. Unfortunately, Israel chose to be bad and ugly. And so he sent Isaiah to pronounce, to proclaim the inevitable judgment to come unless they chose to receive his warning and repent so that he could relent. Now, interspersed within these proclamations to his own nation were prophecies and proclamations to the surrounding nations, including Moab, Syria, specifically Damascus, and also, today as we read, Ethiopia. Yet again, even in the midst of these announcements of inevitable judgment, there was also the proclamations of possible salvation, prophecies concerning a coming Savior who would make salvation possible. Like verse 5 of chapter 16 today, where we read, In mercy the throne will be established, and one will sit on it in truth, in the tabernacle of David, judging and seeking justice and hastening righteousness. Christ was coming for them. Christ has already come for us. And he's coming again to bring salvation for those who are waiting for him and judgment to those who have rejected him. See, there's only one way for you to be saved from the inevitable, eternal consequences of your own sin. Jesus, God's one and only Son, willingly became your substitute. He suffered and died for your sin in your place so that you wouldn't have to. Now that is wonderful and terrifying at the same time. Wonderful in the fact that your price has been paid. The furious fire of God's holy wrath against your own sin has been satisfied and you no longer have to endure it for eternity after you die. But the terrifying part is that you could simply scoff at all of this as simpleton mythology crafted by religious crackpots in an effort to appease their overactive consciences. God gives you that choice. That's the terrifying part. The choice to receive or reject real forgiveness. That's yours. But make sure that you're sure because the decision has eternal consequences. And just know this, God has given you 66 books in the Bible, penned by over 40 different men on three different continents in three different languages over the course of approximately 2,000 years. And yet, it is a fully integrated, flawless message system proving with every prophecy that its origin is outside of time and space and that its author is God himself. God who so loved the world that he sent his only son who willingly went to pay a debt that he did not owe because you owe a debt that you could never, ever pay. And that is the summary of the simple message that is on every single page of this book, this book of books, this Bible that God has given us so that we can know of his great love for us. So if you have not yet surrendered to him, please do so now. You know he's real. You know he's holy. You know that you are a sinner and you know that you need salvation. And in order to receive his salvation, it could be as simple as just saying all of that to him. Tell him, God, I believe that you sent your son to die for my sin. And I believe that after he died, you raised him to life again. Jesus, you are my Lord. You're Lord of all. I want you to be Lord of my life from this day forward, from this moment forward. Please forgive me and receive me. I surrender myself to you and to your will. In Jesus' name, amen. 
Okay, on to our New Testament reading for today in the book of Colossians. Once again, the Apostle Paul is writing from prison, but the letter to the Colossians is a little bit more corrective than the encouraging letter to the Philippians. Colossians is a little bit more like Galatians in that Pastor Paul is trying through the word of God to protect the church in Colossae against the distortion that some have brought of the gospel. Once again, there are those who are twisting the gospel, twisting it to be a little bit more in line with the way that seems right to a man. So Paul encourages them to remain steadfast, immovable, rooted and established in Christ. We read this today in verse 21 of chapter 1. And you who once were alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now he has reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and blameless and above reproach in his sight, if indeed you continue in the faith, grounded and steadfast, and are not moved away from the hope of the gospel which you heard, which was preached to every creature under heaven, of which I, Paul, became a minister. Steadfast, immovable, rooted and established in Christ. We'll read this tomorrow in chapter two, in verse six. As you therefore have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him and established in the faith, as you have been taught, abounding in it with thanksgiving. So now, why all of these exhortations to stand in the simplicity that is the gospel of Jesus Christ? Well, it was because there were those with wise and persuasive words who were perverting the gospel. We'll read this tomorrow in chapter two as well. In verse eight, beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit according to the tradition of men, according to the basic principles of the world and not according to Christ. So we're to beware when Christianity sounds like the way that seems right to a man. Christianity should always be radical. God's ways are not our ways. It doesn't make sense that a holy God would give his only son to save sinful man. It doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense when he tells us to walk with our persecutors two miles when they force us to go one mile. It doesn't make sense to trust Christ and his power instead of making a list, a religion of rules and regulations. But that's where faith comes in. Faith in Christ, the one that reconciled us to God. The very least that we could do in response to what he's done for us in reconciling us to God is to believe him and to follow him and to trust him along the way, no matter how radical it is. And that's how Paul began his little letter to the church in Colossae, saying this in verse 3, we give thanks to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of your love for all the saints because of the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, of which you heard before in the word of truth of the gospel, which has come to you as it is also in all the world and is bringing forth fruit as it is also among you since the day you heard and knew of the grace of God in truth. Faith. Hope, love, the true measures of the health of any church as they collectively and individually respond to the goodness of God. That's the least we can do, right, in response. It's our only reasonable response to how good God has been to us to offer ourselves as a living sacrifice in an endeavor to walk a walk, to live a life worthy of the Lord. Remember that word, worthy? It means equal as if on a scale. See, God and his gifts to us are on one side and our life lived in loving response is on the other. And so Paul said this today in verse nine, for this reason, we also, since the day we heard of it, do not cease to pray for you and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding that you may walk worthy of the Lord fully pleasing him, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all might according to his glorious power for all patience and long suffering with joy, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the light. 
Now, how's that for a run-on sentence? <laughs> Paul was the master of the never-ending sentences that came out of the overflow of his heart that was continually overwhelmed with the goodness of God, endeavoring with his life lived to balance those scales, not in an effort to merit or earn anything, not even in an effort to do anything that was even remotely possible, but rather doing the gloriously impractical, endeavoring to do the impossible because you're in love. You're in love with the one who gave his everything to save you, to forgive you, to give you an eternity with him in life and in love and in joy. In verse 13, we read this today, he has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the son of his love in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. So, are you struggling to live a life worthy of the calling that you have received, worthy of the Lord that loves you so much? Are you struggling to serve the Lord sacrificially? Then maybe you simply have not fully realized exactly what he has done for you already and what he's doing for you presently and what he, what he has waiting for you in eternity. So study his love letter to you. For the more that you see, the more that you'll be free to live that life worthy of the Lord that loves you so much and has forgiven you of so much. Remember the woman weeping, the woman washing the feet of Jesus with her tears, drying them with her hair, anointing them with what may have cost her her everything. Jesus said of her, he, he said of her reasonable response, her endeavor to worship in a worthy way, he said this, therefore I say to you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. But to whom little is forgiven, the same loves little. So study the scriptures, read the word, the word of the Lord to you, and you will see the depths of your sin, yes, on one side, but you'll also see that God's grace is greater.